Hello and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. Sorry if I'm speaking more softly than usual. I have some semi-sleeping um, beasts in the in the room from which I'm broadcasting. Um, but so excited to be joined by honestly, like basic major staple of the show, uh, Beyond the Joy Gray, <laughs> joining us. It's always such a pleasure, Katie. You're my number one favorite stop. You know that. Thank you. And we're both, I guess we're both kind of night owls, right? So we're taking advantage of that to uh, have this emergency. <laughs> about yeah. um, This is like the beginning of my evening, usually. I know. We just woke up. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for stopping by. And Bree, you want to just kind of walk us through what is happening, uh, what we're responding to? Basically, it goes under the umbrella of Biden's leaks. But um, can you set up the context? Yeah. So I believe it was two days ago. Uh, the Intercept released a video of um, a meeting that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris had with representatives from the Black community. Um, Reverend Al Sharpton, um, uh, the head of the NAACP, um, Vita Gupta from um, L uh, Legal Defense Fund, um, uh, Cedric Richardson, who has been in the press a great deal because he was picked as a environmental liaison and one of Biden's chief aides who on the tape, he says, is going to be in the room with me all the time and yet comes from one of the most polluted districts in the country, but is black. And that was kind of put out there as a shield for him um, by certain journalists on John, John Twitter. Martin. John Martin, <laughs> you know? yeah, who chided the Sunrise Movement for criticizing him. Yeah, right. Influential black staffer, as he calls them. Yeah, right. Um, so, what the gist of this meeting was? Each person takes ten minutes or so to outline their request of the administration. And what was so kind of galling is Joe Biden responds in that kind of classic Joe Biden pushy, dictatorial, bullyish tone that we've seen from him a lot, but which for some reason never really got picked up um, by the media, or he never got characterized as a bully in any meaningful way especially when you compare him to how Joe, um, Bernie Sanders was treated. Um, but he basically tells them all the reasons why they should know that he's gonna do the right thing. I mean what I say um, and says a lot of particularly choice things that we're gonna run through and play some clips, I think. But I think the biggest story and the focus of the Intercept's reporting is the extent to which, um, uh, sorry, Johnson, what's his first name from the NAACP? Um, J, J, uh, what is it? Der Derek Johnson. Derek, Derek right. Johnson of the NAACP very gently raises to Joe Biden. And everyone is operating in the most gentle way, almost like they're dealing, they're like, I don't want to say abuse victims, but like they, they know that he has a temper and they are making yeah. the most, you can clear, like, they really care about what they're off there, they're asking him for, but they're asking him in a way that they hope is going to maximize him listening and not responding in the reactionary way right. he kind of does. Antagonistic at all. Right, and so he suggests that appointing Tom Vilsack um, to Secretary of Agriculture would be a mistake, in particular in Georgia, where he has a bad reputation for two reasons. One, because he's a big ag guy who small farmers detest because he supports a lot of trade policies that are very harmful to small farms. He's been a dairy industry lobbyist um, since he left the Obama administration where he had the same post. And second of all, a lot of black groups were pushing for um, uh, Marsha Fudge to be in that position. She's well qualified to do it. And instead, Marsha Fudge has been sidelined into HUD, which is classically a post that black people get sidelined into and something that she had raised as a concern before the picks were actually announced. And secondarily, uh, Vilsack is a problem because he very famously fired Shirley Sherrod after some out of context statements were made public um, during the Obama administration. Um, she Breitbart, was, by the way, and Breitbart leaked it. Oh, interesting. They so Breitbart, it, yeah, publicized okay. it. Yeah. And before the full remarks were ever examined, very, very quickly she was let go. And she, by contrast, was very popular in the state, is a civil rights icon of sorts, and is very popular, despite being black, with Georgia farmers. Um, so uh, after hearing that advice, uh, Joe Biden did not react pleasantly. <laughs> Do we want to go straight to the clip? Sure, yeah. And just so people know, it's just so it's like you kind of can't make it up because she literally said a few days ago, Marsha Fudge, as this country becomes more and more diverse, we're going to have to stop looking at only certain agencies as those that fit people like me in. 
you know, it's always we want to put the black person in labor or HUD. And then Biden turns around. And as you said, despite her interest and expertise in agriculture, puts her into HUD. So, yeah, showing instead of telling. But yeah, let's should we go to some of the audio tape? Yeah, it's at it's at one twenty one fifty one. OK, great. Okay, 121. Here we go. Okay. 12151-ish. Okay. Everyone like while I'm get, getting this up and also make sure you follow Brianna on Twitter, obviously. Um like, subscribe to this channel. And so one sec, did Katie lose her voice? No, Katie's trying not to wake up all the other people in her house. Yeah. Uh, I dragged her into this. My apologies. No, late night. Very, very, <laughs> with very little persuasion. Um, I was, I was, did not need to be peer pressured. Okay. You ready, Freddie? Let me make sure I have this. Can you guys hear me though? I know I'm not being as expressive as usual. But I'm audible. Okay. Equity, equality, fairness. Um, the work that we need to do as an administration cannot get done without your involvement, partnership, support, and influence. She sounds like she's reading. And so I a say memo. hello to all of the friends. Yeah, she didn't talk really. Like this be, have done I'm worried that I didn't really give you the right time stamp and my hurry. No taking generations because okay. I would I not be the it. vice president I mean, it's, it's of so the United States elect so were it bored. not. <laughs> um, She's not even putting the energy into pander. As soon as she stops talking, it should be the clip that we're talking oh, about. Oh, you know what happened? It's actually me. It's my bad. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Somehow it moved. It's 121.50, you said? Yeah. You wanted me to be concerned, Derek. I think it was you said it. Yeah. Right. About, is it earlier know, than this? Uh, no, this is it. Okay. I was right on. He's talking to Derek John Johnson mm -hmm. right from the NAACP in case you're mm -hmm. just joining us. Uh, dealing with uh, Vilsack as uh, in uh, in terms of a ter of uh, agriculture. Okay. Well, first of all, you will learn more about Vilsack's record. But my point is this: you'll learn more about I his don't record. Think we should make that a big issue going into before January 5th, when the election takes place down in in uh, um, uh, in uh, Georgia. But I also don't think we should get too far ahead of ourselves on dealing with police reform in that because they've already labeled us as being defund the police. Anything we put forward in terms of the organizational structure to change policing, which I promise you will occur, promise you. Just think to yourself and give me advice whether we should do that before January 5th because that's how they beat the living hell out of us across the country saying that we're talking about defunding the police. We're not. We're talking about holding them accountable. We're talking about giving them money to do the right things. We're talking about putting more psychologists and psychiatrists on the telephones when the 911 calls through. We're talking about spending money to enable them to do their jobs better, not more with more force with less force poor, poor and more Derek understanding. With his arms. But that's, I just <laughs> raise it with you to think about. I mean, part of what's amazing about this is, is it Al Sharpton? Between now and January Yeah, Al Sharpton on the right. Oh my God, look at him. He's like trying not to, he's literally like trying to keep his mouth closed. I mean, part of what's amazing about this is how little pushback anybody gives in the context of this call, with the exception of Sherilyn Eiffel, who like kind of does, like she interrupts him later on to bring it back to an earlier point and he kind of bulldozes it through it again but she still does so very 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 gently so obviously what's wild about this response is that he took a legitimate concern about what's going on in georgia and the risks of a tom velsic appointment to this crucial state that the whole party has turned its eye to and ignores that legitimate critique and pivots to defund the police as the be all end all destroyer of democratic futures. And when of course we know there's absolutely no evidence in the world to point to the fact that defund the, defund the police is what caused the terrible down ballot results um, on election day. Yeah, and also who said it? That's the other thing. Like who was who was uh, campaigning on that slogan? Nobody. 
I mean, yeah. well, Cori Bush, yeah. <laughs> and she won. Right, she won, yeah. In a purple state. Right, right. That's true, yeah. Yeah. Oh, completely defying all of the settled logic and expectations. So we all know that Joe Biden is crap. You know, sorry, yeah. I could measure my, moderate my tone a little bit. Has, there's room for improvement. <laughs> right. There's some uh, growing pains. Right. But it's almost as though you can see them setting up the narrative for if they lose in Georgia. It's going to be to fund right. the police and there won't be even a modicum of press attention to whether or not the Tom Vilsack appointment had an effect in a, in a state that is heavily rural and whose rural population is diverse and black and white farmers alike have a problem with this pick. Right, and also there'll be no examination of you know what the effect of Alsop being totally moderate, not inspiring, running on literally nothing except not being a Republican. And to be fair, his guy, his opponent is so awful that that's like a sub, you know, that's a, that's something to run on, but of course that's not really, that doesn't get people out to the polls. Right, of course. Uh, and we also need, I mean, I'm just making them on the most cynical level. Like, forget the fact that this is Medicare for all is a life and death moral issue. Like, putting that aside, it's just a stupid tactic to just be running against the the Republican incumbent. Um, yeah, it's interesting, though. It's kind of like he's like, well, you know, since we're talking about the whole Georgia black thing, let me just draw your attention to another whole Georgia black thing I would like you to address. Like, it's not it doesn't respond to what they're saying at all. Yeah. He's like, yeah. not, not only is he not taking responsibility, or addressing it, he's like, and I'll tell you something else. Yeah, he's like that throughout too. I mean, people can characterize it how they want to characterize it. And I know a lot of liberals are very offended by the idea that he yes. perhaps is not as, you know, cogent as he used to be. No. But the reality is- I, he called I, Obama uh, clean and articulate. <laughs> yeah, the, the halcyon day. Yeah. But when you listen to the whole thing, like I, I was listening to um, Roland Martin did a breakdown and he actually was making some solid points. Um, but there was somebody on the panel who was like, I can't, I don't respect this clip because one is from the intercept and two, it's only 18 minutes and I'm sure they doctored it. Well, here's the whole clip. And I was, you know, the whole, I had listened to the whole clip and the whole clip is not better for Biden. What it really reveals is how meandering and unfocused he is. And how he keeps dipping into these weird racial asides, one of which I want us to go to next, Katie, because I haven't heard anybody draw any attention to this yet, because it's not really substantive and of news value, but it's just so bizarre. Okay, where is it? It's at 128. So he, I mean, Kamala finally gets a chance to speak, and he interrupts her immediately to say this. Okay, 128. Is it 120, more or less? Yeah, but I wanna just catch the end of Kamala so we can sure. hear the interruption. Of course. So let's just come up with a plan mm -hmm. and, and a roadmap for how we Mark, can get- Mark, you're gonna get be angry with me. I wanna, yeah, I wanna say one more thing. I am incredibly optimistic. Let me tell you why. I'm incredibly optimistic because society is changing. The Z generation and young millennials are changing. The ones he has no empathy for. You're not going to remember. Maybe agree with no what I'm about to say. Yeah. Take a look at what is happening. Watch this. 15 years ago, could you turn on the television and see three or four out of seven commercials be biracial commercials? <laughs> what do you think, guys? Huh? What do you think? Biracial. You want to know where society's going? ERC. Watch entertainment. Watch the profit motive. Why are these commercials so many of them biracial? Yeah. The yeah. young generation is changing. They're demanding more. They don't come with the baggage. Maybe 10, yes. 20, 25% of them are pure racist. Who knows? But the vast majority, the vast majority are... <laughs> My racial commercial enthusiasts. When I was coming up. And the second thing has changed is that you and I have talked about this, Al. Remember what Dr. King said? Oh okay, he's about to go into another crazy time. thing. Can you just pause it for a second? Yeah. So when I listened to that for the first time, I like, I lost my mind. <laughs> like, I, I, I truly don't know what that is or what that's supposed to mean. Like the idea that you just sat through an hour of some of the most preeminent civil it's rights like, figures of our time. time. This is <laughs> right? Green Book was a great film. Yeah. Like he just, these people, everyone on this call very seriously and meaningfully put to him a whole list of really grave concerns. 
serious concerns that the black community in particular is dealing with in this at this crisis point. You know, Sherlyn Eiffel called on him in particular, please, 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 Mr. Future President, President Elect, can you use your executive authority to do all of these things? She gave a whole list of things that he could do, that he could do even if things go south in Georgia. And he came back and there is a whole soliloquy that we should go back to about how he wasn't going to use uh, executive authority and then was to come back and interrupt Kamala Harris, his the first black vice president, to offer this little tidbit about how things aren't really looking so terrible because there are a lot of biracial kids in television commercials these days. Yeah, someone wrote, Anthony uh, wrote, um, wait, where is this? Someone wrote Arrested Development. It went really quickly. But someone said, this is like Arrested Development. Did I make that up? No, this is like Arrested Development. I don't even know what you mean. Sorry, and it's just you, the, the randomness of it. It is, it is, it is like there's something about it. I don't know what it is, but that that really rings true to me. Yeah. Also, like how I mean, commercials should be more biracial. You were born in the what the 40s? <laughs> like, that's but not it, a they didn't have black people in commercials, much less yeah, mixed race right. families. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and the idea that the profit motive is dictating. Yeah, exactly. Well, well, capitalism recognizes black people can buy things now. So look at that, guys. You ever think about that? Some lazy people? Oh, my God. Okay, so where's the That's next? outrageous. So he goes on. I don't know. I mean, this isn't like the most news substantive bit either. But the next little soliloquy is him talking about dogs biting the flesh of black people in the civil rights movement. Oh, okay. And it's just, it's visceral. It's a lot. Yeah. I mean, when you're, the thing is that that's what kept him away from the civil rights movement. He really fears dogs. So that's why he wasn't there. <laughs> well, according to him, he, he, was, he a, was one of the leaders of the civil rights movement. And in a soliloquy that I don't think we should play, he talks about how, well, maybe it's a part and parcel of this, but he talks about how, you know, he knew how much it changed because when he was a student out of college in Delaware and he used to stand on the train tracks, he could see one side of the town that was white and developed and one side of the town that was black and not. And later, as he stood on the train tracks waiting for the train to arrive to take him to the inauguration or to meet up with Barack Obama or whatever, to be the first black president of the United States of America, um, he thought, wow, we went from that to now I'm catching the train to, to get Barack Obama inaugurated and look yeah. how far we've come. Yeah. I mean, it's like text. He said that, uh, he said that during one of the, the news things, right? Yeah, during one of the... Um town halls. Oh, this is a bit that he's been replaying. Oh yeah, he did that. At, where was the one in Florida where he where he was like, you know, totally pandered to some Miamian uh, concerned about like the socialists. And he, you know, it was one of the many times during the campaign he he mentioned that he, he he's the one who beat the socialists. But yeah, he brought up that story. I'm sure it's in a book too. I'm sure. Um, yeah. But okay, let's, let's, uh, yeah. Okay, let's play this. I mean, he did, to be fair, I just want people to know he was a lifeguard in a swimming pool that black people swam in. Um, he did a lot of work, anti-racist training with corn pop, um, <laughs> peace be upon him. And he also, um, black children would, would play with his golden leg hair. Do you remember that? Yeah, you can't make this stuff up. And somehow, up. you know, look, this, this I will acknowledge that that stuff isn't the most important sure. stuff, but yeah. it's important insofar as it's useful. I think it's necessary that we point out the media's bias angle of this. Right. Because if, I'm sorry, Bernie Sanders or any other progressive candidate who was on the wrong side of the corporate aisle were to have said any of that, it would have been playing nonstop. Yeah, how about just lying? How about saying you got arrested visiting... Um, Nelson Mandela, and you then didn't get arrested at all. There was no arrest. Yeah. Andrew Young was like, no, I was there. He didn't get arrested. I mean, it's just insane. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's we're play some more of this. On those black women and sig the dogs on them, ripping their clothes off, going in their Sunday go to church vest and rip, ripping the skin off of those kids. He said it was responding. That He's was supposed MLK to be the right one stake right? in the heart of the civil rights movement. Uh, Remember what uh, he said? It's a, he said, it's a quote. That was yeah. the most significant thing that happened in terms of freedom. What happened was we got the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act out of that. That young man who stood with a camera, a cell phone, like millions of people have, and stood there for eight minutes and 46 seconds and took a picture of George Floyd asking for his mom, Wasn't seeing his woman? nose broken against that curb. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, what happened? 
You saw a response around America and around the world. World. The world. Doesn't mean we don't have a big fight to go, but the first thing we had to do, and because of you, we get it done, is get rid of the racist Donald Trump. The first thing. Don't defund the police, the though. We got to do is go back and appeal this to is those after folks. He won, right? I mean, who this some is of that, some of that yeah, seventy million. Not appeal by giving them anything, but appeal by moving hard toward what will benefit them as well. If that you notice, like them whenever I make those not. speeches about <laughs> civil rights like and should, civil liberties you know. and but he's, of course, not talking about universal programs that are good and great. Economic <laughs> quality. Talking about to saying, I'm, I'm going to fund the police harder. I make them to white chambers of commerce. I make them to white audiences because I got to remind them: you want your community to look better, make sure black folks can own a house. You want to make sure your community does better. Make sure everybody's making 15 bucks an hour minimum. You want to make your community better? Make sure everybody's making more money. It's never, 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 never hurt the wealthy. They always do better. But it gives the poor a way up and the middle class a shot. So yeah. I just think we have a way up. I think the American we could probably move to a bar. different part, but like that's you you get the gist of how this goes, right? He just he grant he grandstands and tells his classic tales in a way that's completely non-responsive to the specific and substantive concerns that have been raised by this panel. Right. Um, and to the extent that there's any remarks from the people on the panel, just then as you saw in that clip, it was it was people kind of ushering him on and saying, yes, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Um, no pushback at all except from anyone, except for Sherilyn Eiffel, and very little revealed even in the facial expressions. I, I, I don't, I'm I almost know. impressed. I know, did they take something before? <laughs> I don't know what you could even take that would make you like that. But. Yeah. Um, okay. Mine so, taken off. Oh my God. Yeah, tell me there, I mean, there are a couple of, okay, so, one significant, another significant moment that hasn't really been reported out as of yet is at one nineteen sixteen. Um, there has been there have been I don't know if you saw this, Katie. Some stories floated about um, Maya Harris, who's Kamala Harris's sister and was Hillary Clinton's campaign manager. She was something senior on the Hillary campaign, senior advisor, something like that. Um, her husband, Tony West who's chief legal officer at Uber being floated for attorney general. And one of the points that was made really strongly by Vanita Gupta from the, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund here um, was that the whoever fills that role needs to be really familiar with the office and to be able to start on, on day one, given how much Donald Trump has done to degrade all the civil rights protections, all the voting rights protections, all the things we've been talking about the last four years that we are supposed to care a lot about, which Democrats have done a lot of posturing around. And Tony West would be kind of a clear nepotism slap in the face. Um, and Joe Biden is somewhat responsive and might give it, gives us some clues here into who it might be at 119.16. <clears throat> the departments, you will see that as well. We need you did a hell of a job in the civil rights division. I, I, I really mean it. But you will see that is critical. And I think it matters how we start off. I Again, I, I'll conclude by saying one of the things I learned early on was that if in order to get things done in the Congress or the Senate, I start off by always going after my opponent's motive. I'm never going to get anything done. That. When I talk about dealing with the whole notion of what we're going to do in terms of infrastructure, I'm talking about it across the board. I'm not talking about just building highways. I'm talking to making sure that we have safe water. I'm, I'm going to make sure we have clean water. I'm going to make sure that we can breathe the clean air. I'm going to make you realize all the folks who are getting clobbered by climate are all fence line communities, which you all come from. Front line. The black community, the poor community. They're the ones who are dying overwhelmingly as a consequence of the impacts of climate change. And he's They're saying that with Cedric Richardson saying, sitting right there. In my climate prop 
policies. Climate's about equity. It's not just about being able to breathe clean air. Yeah. Is this 119 yeah. And we're going to build oh, back in a way that we're going to yeah, create significant yeah. jobs for folks that, in fact, represent what minority communities. I don't know. That maybe I. Oh, maybe it's it is 116. It's hard to do that. And no one's fought harder to get rid of assault weapons than me. I think me. keep bringing up assault weapons. It was really odd. Order. If you do that, next guy comes along and says, well, guess what? By executive order, I'm going to say everybody can own machine oh, yeah, guns I again. I talking about that. So we got to be careful. I know you all know this. Mm. I know you know it. I, I, you, and poor Kamala's heard me say this, and so has Cedric. I used to have a friend named Bob Gold who was a really bright guy. Okay. Not oh, much of it. We don't need the Bob Gold. He wasn't an academic whiz, but bright as hell. Well, yeah, and as he grew up, he gave, became very successful. And I look at him. He died of a heart transplant. And He's so like about um, 30 years, Fred Willard 20 years ago, I, I said to him, Bob, you understand what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about? Do you, do you understand me? He looked at me and said, Joe, I not only understand you, I overstand you. I'm mm -hmm. sure you overstand me here. I did. Okay, that's a. I don't yeah, I, I don't. Sorry, I might have. I was <laughs> rushing to write this down, and I might have missed that. But the point of the, he says he will pick an AG with a significant record on civil rights, and to me, that would exclude Tony West. Well, to we'll be fair, he has a record with with civil rights because <laughs> Uber violates civil rights um, all the Touché, time. Touche, Katie. So he's pretty appropriate. Yeah. Touche. I mean. I, we can go back over, obviously, the main clip that everyone's been playing today is him ranting about how he's not going to use executive authority and the Constitution, the Constitution, the Constitution. We have to follow the Constitution because if we, you know, I'm not going to use executive action to ban assault weapons, which nobody asked him to do. I mean, what hasn't been played for, you know, good reasons because it's a little bit dry is what each of the panelists asked for in the first half of the of the thing, but when you listen to the very detailed requests that Sherilyn Eiffel and Vidita Gupta in particular offered up, specifically saying, this is what you can do with executive orders. This is what you can do with executive orders. And then to hear Joe Biden bluster through it so defensively, it's, it, it does not bode well. You know, it does not inspire hope that he will bring the same tenacity to the presidency that Trump very effectively had and used to, you know, destroy the country. Yeah. It's, we, we should do another stream where we do a deep dive of this pre, by the way. Um, yeah. Re edit it and stuff. But I, I wanted to also talk about, um, I don't know which clip it is, but he says something like, I got to go, but which is what he did also on um, uh, the breakfast club. Mm. He likes being like, I got to go, but, and then he chastises everyone in the room for not giving him more respect. He basically says the equivalent of if you're black, um, and what was it like, if you're, if you're not voting for Joe Biden, you're not black. Yeah. Like he does that kind of with the, with this group of people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me see if I can find. And then we um, should make sure we talk um, briefly about the media response to this, which is just stunning. We should. And I see some people who want us to talk about ASD too. I'm not yeah. sure if we want to get into that. Yeah. So I think it might be at 105. Um, this is when he, he's going, he's going out on Sherilyn Eiffel about how he's been talking about this stuff longer than her. <laughs> and I think that might be, I think that might be the section that we're talking about. Black farmers be able to own their own property. Jesus Christ. It's so offensive to like go into speech mode when you're talking to people like this is supposed to be a discussion. Right. And ladies, with experts. We're on the same exact page. The same exact page. We talked about closing the racial, the, the, the racial wealth gap. That's the single biggest thing I want to get done. It's the ultimate equalizer, no matter what else happens. Because I plan on spending over $15 billion to provide for opportunity for young black entrepreneurs to get them off the ground black farmers to be able to own their own property, young people being able to get their first 15,000 bucks down payment on a home, making sure that they have an opportunity to gain wealth. We can do all the rest of this unless the black community is able to make up the wealth gap, in my humble opinion, is real trouble. I support same day registration. His opinion, the race, the racial wealth gap is a, is a problem. Back for 25 years as a United States Senator. Before, Sherilyn, you were even involved. 
I got it. I started off, I'm much older than you. That's why I got involved in politics. The assault on the black vote and voting rights across the nation has never been more ugly than it is today. You got to go all the way back to the original Jim Crow to get where this guy is. If in case you haven't looked, we have the largest voting right, Kristen, my operation, 1,000 lawyers, Kristen. bigger than you or anybody else out there on voting rights. I have more well, lawyers than the NAACP legal defense fund. Not a joke. 1,000. <sighs> so I want you to know, I understand this. I know, look at the 38 cases that have been brought against my being president of the United States, all about phony, phony actions. And so I think there should be same day registration, automatic voting rights. I've been pushing and I got a number of people that contribute significantly to the effort down in Florida to make sure that uh, uh, that federal uh, um, prisoners, who serve, uh, prisoners who serve their time have every single right restored to them. That's been my position before it was anybody else's position. I've been out pushing that. In addition to that, I think it's really important that no one goes to prison for a drug offense. Really? Nobody. Of they go into rehabilitation. Well, well, he has this rehabilitation. Biden, That's what we should be building. Yeah, exactly. Rehabilitation centers, not more prisons. I have, a, I have a $20 billion effort that I'm proposing to get states to change their sentencing guidelines so that there is no more mandatory sentences across the board. In addition to that, we're talking about having diversity hiring in every agency. I promise you that is going to happen. We're just getting started here. Police reform, judicial reform. Look, you know, when I was, if you notice, when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee and when I was advising the president, who did we get on the court? We got on a woman who worked for me, became a member of the Supreme Court. Another woman who was a leading Hispanic in America, no one paid attention to, is on the court. No one paid attention to <laughs> so Biden found her. Then we found her, have yeah. been really pro-civil rights judges Clarence Thomas. across the board. <laughs> and I like you, the idea, Kristen, that we have to, have, everybody has to be a prosecutor. I'm a public defender. When I'm president of the United States of America, I we're enjoy that. With the public defenders, federal defenders get paid the same as federal prosecutors. Mm -hmm. So, so Sherlyn, I had earlier had the brought up the point, I guess I'm trying to say here that the federal judiciary has been taken over by prosecutors. And it's funny because obviously Kamala Harris is California's top cop by her own description. And it was you want to be able to see their faces more clearly because Sherilyn Eiffel, it seemed almost like she was throwing a little shade, saying, you know, it's it's irresponsible that we have so many prosecutors. It seems to be almost a requirement to be a prosecutor, be on the federal bench. We need to support public defenders. You were a public defender and really goading him on. And so he clearly liked that because that was like 20 minutes ago and he's bringing it back up again. Meanwhile, Kamala's just sitting there oh my God. <laughs> twiddling her thumbs. Wow. So I don't know how much more of this you want to do. At 109, he does the whole I'm the first person of color to talk about racial disparities bit that people have been playing. Yeah, in, in COVID. I'm sorry, I'm the first person, sorry, not of color. <laughs> My bad. But I'm the first person to talk about racial disparities in COVID. Um, and I know that because uh, my white mayor friend called and told me. Okay, let's go. What was it? 109? Everything we've done. Yeah, 109. For exist because of racial discrimination. And Ms. Campbell, that's what this is all about. Making sure that, you may remember, I'm the first person, black or white, who called attention to the fact that you were finding that there was the, the rate of people who were African-Americans were dying was three times that of, of, of white people. That's because a friend of mine, a white guy who happens to be, as you well know, Derek, the mayor of the city of Detroit, called me to tell me about it. I insisted that we keep a record on everything that happened since then. Guys, guess what I'm saying, guys? Do we have, I mean, I, I wish we had a, a research team to cut in the quotes of other people talking about this issue before he did. I mean, also the idea that it should give us confidence that that kind of really necessary information is getting out there and trickling up to the top because 
a white guy who's the mayor of Detroit who happens to be my friend got me on the phone and talked to me about it. Like CDC much? Like, right. Is there yeah. anybody else uh, in the channels of information flow who you can rely on <laughs> than this kind of ad hoc network? Yeah. Um, it's sad that Bob Gold died because he would have overstood this. <laughs> Um, in a little bit, he's about to get into the the, the clip. Um, Dis, he had know, been leaned on to you know, about appointing more black people. And so he gives his response about why he cannot tell you about who it is at this moment. Please tell me he's standing literally behind Kamala. I do <laughs> what I say. The hard part here is I'm going to have a lot of trouble. We're going to have a lot of trouble getting a lot of this done with this Congress. And so the question is, for example, you know, I'm going to be appointing at least, and I'm, you know, look, the reason I'm not telling you who the other black maybe cabinet positions I'm going to appoint are maybe. because it will get out. And guess what? I can't defend them. They're going to be out there by themselves without any defense before their name. They're going to get ripped to shreds. That's why I'm going to wait. You will be pleased, I believe. You will be pleased to see major, there'll be more African-Americans in major positions within a cabinet in major spots and more Hispanics in major spots than ever in American history. You know what? I don't and understand that, about that. I, I mean, promise I, you that. I would get it if it were before and an election or something. Is, for example, what's he waiting for? Are, what you know, what for is it going to be that they will be safe from public criticism? You know, and he's, he's president now. I mean, he won. So what, what is it? He thinks that if he can do it closer to inauguration, then what? We won't talk about it, but it's it'll be set in stone. After Georgia, I guess his thing is after Georgia. Well, that would be of of import for someone like Tom Vilsack, who's already right. been announced. I don't okay. know. I mean, I, if you I want have to, to, I have to run to the bathroom. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> you want to keep? Um, do you want to take some questions? Oh sure. It just, I, it's not planned. My uh, yeah yeah but yeah. I have to go. Okay. All right. I'm gonna. Uh, should I close the square? I wish I could show. Sure. Should I just keep, scroll keep, down keep, into the chat yeah. and look at what people are saying? Yeah. I'm gonna pop I'll okay. keep that on. I'll keep do you want this on or just you? I'll keep it this way. Yeah, this is this is fine. Okay. So I'm looking at the chat. I'm scrolling. I don't see a ton of questions. Uh when's Dora coming on? I don't know. I'm not sure about that. That's Katie's department. <laughs> um, we're gonna talk about AOC. Sit tight. We are getting there. I just was, I've, this, this stuff has been driving me crazy. And I, when I was watching Roland Martin and they were acting as though the full video isn't out there and claiming that it was somehow altered uh, in some way, it was making me nuts. Okay, Hoot Hoot Burns. Hey, Hoot Hoot. Biden shouting hurts my ears, but gotta love he's at his most passionate and telling people you can't have nice things or talking about himself. I don't see the lie. You know, it's, it's hard to put into words and I, you know, I'm wary. I, I don't want to be seen as kind of like knifing him in the back or like t twisting the knife when it's in or anything. I, I'm not, it's not that I'm rooting against him per se, but it's when no one else is willing to leverage even the most moderate criticism of the guy and you see these kind of like blatant errors and blatant missteps that would be a whole new cycle for any other candidate. I think it forces us to go harder in the paint as it were than we might otherwise. And you know, I don't know, man. Um, did I skip any others? Uh, talk about Jay Jackson ASD. Yeah, we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it. Love you guys too. Um, when will the progressive media unite and call upon the real base to rise up and demand with one care for Medicare for all? You know, we recorded an episode of Bad Faith today with two comedians who I really like and respect, but who aren't like big political people. And I asked them, you know, what do you think is going on? Like as someone who's more of a normie, how do you as an outsider, how do you perceive this infighting between the left and the more moderate wing or conservative wing of the Democratic Party? Do you think this is gonna be reflected in the comedy that comes out going forward? Are we gonna still just get all this Trump is bad stuff? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that the people are with us. They were very receptive. They liked the ideas, they liked the politics. But I mean, it was a Star Trek theme ep themed episode. And we're talking about expanding using Star Trek and how sci-fi can expand the realm of what's possible, what people believe are po is possible. 
And it's like they're there. We've already done so much of that work. Bernie Sanders has already done so much of that work. The polls are with us. Like they're with us in so many respects. But there's just some spark that's missing. And maybe it's the spark that Sarah Nelson was talking about on on Thursday's episode, yesterday's episode. Um, that people just really need to believe that a different kind of action can help. That you know, withholding labor can be the thing that gets people's attention. That protesting in the streets isn't as effective as protesting in front of the homes or offices of the representatives who are actually withholding aid is more effective, you know? I don't know. Um, Brianna, what are your thoughts on Nina running as a dim? Should she run as an independent? You know, I think that we all understand the need for a third party and Senator Turner has been very supportive of the people's movement. It's a somewhat different question of whether or not um, you can be more effective. And at this, I think Senator Turner's choice is being driven by the fact that the seat in her home district is opening up. And it feels like it would be a missed opportunity, frankly, to not go for that. It's not like she randomly is you know, picking some house seat in some random district. It is her home district. It is a seat in Cleveland in a community that she is known in and loved in. And I think we all understand the value of having squad members and the squad growing. The whole reason we're even having this conversation about the, the Jimmy Dore theory of how they should withhold their votes um, uh, and threaten not to you know, make Nancy Pelosi speaker again unless they put Medicare for all to a floor vote is because they have more progressives, more leftists than they do the margin between um, Democrats and Republicans, right? They need them to make a majority. So, you know, obviously there's utility to having people, Democrats in, in Congress. If you're asking why she didn't just run on that seat as an I, I don't know. I don't know, it's an interesting question. Um, oh, how do I do, how do I look at this? Does it just take longer than two to three election cycles to roll back 40 years of neo-lib, neocon alliances? You know, that's a really interesting historical question. And I'd like to know someone who is more of a New Deal expert to say, you know, how do you know, what were the steps to get from the Gilded Age to the New Deal? Because it wasn't that long chronologically. Um, and, you know, I'd like to think that with technology and everything we have today, that things can move a lot more quickly than they have in the past. Information can spread a lot faster and minds can change more quickly. But maybe that's my own um, self-soothing optimism. Hey, Katie. Hey, I'm back. Okay. Sorry about that. So what were we talking about? What's, what did I miss? Um, I answered a question about Nina Turner running as an independent and this question about how long it takes to get rid of um, entrenched neoliberalism. Oh, good question. Um, well, not sure about that, but do we want to talk uh, quickly about the response to this in terms of... Yeah, let's let's talk about the response. The with AOC thing too. Mm, yes, 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 yes. Okay, so which route should we start with? Let's start with um, let's start with the response to this. Yeah. Can so, you tell us what sidebar? Obviously, this this is huge. I mean, there's like four or five different reported stories that could come out of this, right? Everyone cares about Georgia. There's implications for Georgia. There are obvious racial implications. The the optics of Joe Biden yelling at some of the most you know high ranking black luminaries in America is not good. Um, we haven't even hit some of the big ticket clips that have kind of been fleshed out in the media right now that I'm not AOC, but I get more done than anybody you know. The whole thing about how you're going to have to work with Hispanics because there's more of them than you, which is obviously factually true, but like said in a way like there's like a zero sum game and like racial uh, fisticuffs that have to be done to see who can come out on top. Um, and obviously the whole executive order thing, which we've touched on. But in spite of all of that, the the kind of black media intelligentsia has been largely silent on this today. The media elite media class in its entirety has been largely silent on this today. And to the extent that they've spoken up, it has been in defense of Joe Biden and critical of the intercept, casting aspersions on the integrity of the outlet. 
Um, and then April Ryan in particular, who is one of the most known White House reporters we have, right? Who has gotten a lot of attention because she's been the lightning rod for some racist comments from Donald Trump, which is not good. She didn't she doesn't deserve that. Um, but she came out today. Um, are we gonna throw the tweet up or should I just read it? Yeah, can you read it? Um, okay. Or I can find it. Let me see, I can read it. Once yeah, I DM'd it to you. Here we go. Um, so she said, um, uh, so someone tweeted, um, she said, the, it, it is, someone said, it, uh, who, who tweeted that? Well, first, first, first we had an inclination that she was opposed to it, um, because she tweeted, the question is who, uh, who leaked this and why? I'm also told by a rights leader in that meeting that Joe Biden was being more passionate than defensive. Can't wait to hear what the Biden camp has to say. This is a reporter, right? So her her first instinct is to say, oh, here are all these stories I should report out. Let me follow up on whether any of this stuff is true. Let me use what I learned from this meeting to press the campaign on what its picks are actually gonna be. And does it have concerns about how Tom Vilsack is gonna fly in, in Georgia? And does it have a plan to meet those concerns off at the pass? And you know, can I talk to these civil rights leaders and see if they had concerns and that's why maybe one of them leaked it? You know, like who knows? No, her, 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 her investigative instinct is to say, can't wait to see what the Biden camp has to say. That's embarrassing, it's so embarrassing. And so then most kind of hilariously, um, a leftist laid some bait. <laughs> so um, this guy, Edward Ang Angueso, who writes for Jacobin apparently, I'm not familiar with him, but I'm definitely gonna do a deep dive now because he quote tweeted April Ryan and wrote, it is irresponsible and sets a dangerous precedent for journalists covering the incoming administration to be able to use secretly recorded conversations in their stories. To parse out Biden's thoughts and anticipate his policy commitments, you must go through proper channels. So he was being tongue in cheek. This was an ironic tweet. Okay, okay. phew, he was. Okay. <laughs> this was yeah, an he, ironic he's tweet. The new, written, he's great, he writes at um, the New Republic. Okay, he seems new great. Mag, yeah. But April Ryan first responded to him, agreed, and then seemed to like want to highlight this take even more because she agreed with it so hard um, and ended up quote tweeting it um, and saying, you hit the nail on the head. This is not good at all. She felt emboldened by someone who is being sarcastic. <laughs> right. So not only is that the idea that a journalist shouldn't be interested in information that is of utility to the public and in the public interest, coming out, this isn't, I mean, obviously I'm supportive of, you know, uh, WikiLeaks and uh, Edward Snowden and uh, Julian Assange and like, I'm supportive of those which are even closer to the line, but this is just, this is not espionage, okay? No, <laughs> like, and, and this is someone defending Trump that way. Exactly, and here's the thing, April Ryan has been on the other side of this issue. So um, she, uh, has tweeted, you know, CNN obtains Trump Cohen tape, like eagerly awaiting the results of that. Um, she, she tweeted, who is eagerly waiting to hear the audio tapes of Melania Trump talking about, talking bad about the real Donald Trump, Ivanka Trump and the rest of his adult children? I'm ready, exclamation point. Well, you want to, I have to, again, I have a, a friend visiting me. Uh, this actually sounds much more exciting than it is. <laughs> um, there's a little person here and, um, so I have to get off, but we could continue this. And this for us, Brie, this was still almost an hour. For us, this is like, it's like five minutes for most people. We were going to be, we were like, we'll do a 15 to 30 minute thing. But um, You're right, I'm sorry. I'm right. No, no don't. Do I do this with you all the time, but you want to stay on? You can just, you can hijack the stream. I can let you. What happens when I, how do I control it? Uh, well, that's the thing. You can't really control it, but I can check in. You can go as for as long as you want. You just have <laughs> No, to that's okay. I would actually do is just figure out Twitch. I'll figure I'll, out. I'll you tomorrow. I'll okay. Really you'll, you'll teach me that. Anyway, thank questions. you for indulging me. I was like, all my things. We never talked about the ASC Justin Jackson thing. Do you want to see tomorrow? Let's come back to it tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. So guys, I'm gonna we'll tweet out when tomorrow, but when it's not an empty promise, we're gonna make time tomorrow. Okay. Right. Yeah. We'll get into this more loudly and more. Yeah. We can have. We can have like. Um, we can make it brunch time. Do drinks, or we'll do the evening. Who are we going? Right. <laughs> Brunch at this rate, I don't know that I'm going to be awake before 2 p.m. Yeah. It's a Saturday. Yeah, Saturday. That's the day we're supposed to. 
I mean, both of those days, I think, <laughs> depending on what religion. Um, yeah, our, our labor forefathers worked hard for that Saturday. Um, okay, so guys, everyone follow Brie. You'll see us sometime tomorrow. We'll put a link in this to when we're doing it. And uh, yeah, this is fun. This is uh, fun. We have to do an emergency reaction. So everyone else is on notice. And we'll, maybe we'll get a little, yeah, we'll do a little discussion about AOC tomorrow. Yeah. On yeah. notice, progressive squad, squad <laughs> goals. Squad goals. <laughs> and okay. All right. Bye. Good night, Katie. Good night, everyone. <laughs>